Good evening. I'm Tony Clark from the Carter Presidential Library. I am so glad that you all are here tonight. You know, this is really a very special night. You know, President Carter has stood in this room countless times, addressing the needs for free and fair elections, uh, praising the work of human rights defenders all around the globe, and anyone who has visited next door at the Carter Presidential Museum would see by his example what can be achieved when parties, political parties, work together for the good of this country. And that's why it is so fitting for us to have Heather Cox Richardson here in this room tonight. As you all know, she is a professor of history at Boston College, an expert on American politics and political or in economic history. That's the thing that I really like about her newsletter because she puts it in context. She distills the controversies that are going on and puts it in, in context. She's the author of seven books, including the award-winning How the South Won the Civil War, her work has appeared in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Guardian, other outlets, and of course there is that wonderful newsletter that I read every single day, like I think most of you. And tonight, we are especially pleased to have her joined by Melita Esters, the executive director and the founding chair of the Georgia Win List, and we appreciate members of the Georgia Win List being here tonight. It's an organization dedicating to getting women elected to office, which is something that is very close to President Jimmy Carter's heart. Melita is also a former journalist and a regular panelist on the Georgia Gang, America, Atlanta's longest running political affairs program. So please join me in welcoming Heather Cox Richardson and Melita Estes. Thank you so much for the kind introductions. Um, it's wonderful to be on this stage after having been in the audience for so many book events over the years. And also, it's wonderful to be here with Heather. This crowd and the hundreds of um, watching on live stream demonstrates the deep respect her audience has for her calm, skillful, compelling placement of current events into historical perspective. So given that the Carter Center stage is where we sit, the fact that former President Carter celebrated his 99th birthday on October 1st, <laughs> I want us to begin the conversation by asking Heather how she assesses both his presidency and his lengthy post-presidency. So a small question to start. <laughs> One of the things that really jumps out to me now under the Biden administration is the degree to which it is indebted to the Carter administration. And while there are the obvious things in domestic policy to talk about, I am fascinated by the degree to which early in his presidency, President Carter called out uh, the Nixon administration for its foreign policy in places like Chile. And one of the things that Carter said early on, showcased early on, was the idea that foreign policy must rest in human rights. That idea, I think, has been developed since then, especially by Democratic presidents, um, and in the, the, I think has grown fruit in the Biden administration with the question of how one <coughs> in a democracy spreads that ideology without embracing colonialism. That's a hard question, right? It's an intellectual problem. How do you both spread democracy and make sure you're not spreading colonialism? And the idea of having a foreign policy that rests in regionalism, 
regional places where everybody has a seat at the table, everybody who's involved has a seat at the table, that focuses primarily on human rights, strikes me as being today's flowering of the Carter administration's focus on human rights in, in foreign policy. So uh, that was a long way to answer what is fascinating me right now as I'm working my way through the Carter papers in foreign affairs, but I think that if historians write the history of this period, and they might, <laughs> President Carter is going to look very good indeed. Yes. Well, speaking of human rights, President Carter's 2002 Nobel Peace Prize recognized, quoting the Peace Prize, um, decades of untiring efforts to find peaceful solutions to international conflicts, to advance democracy and human rights, and to promote economic and social development. He obviously famously brokered the peace treaty between Israel and Egypt at Camp David. So, could you, in that perspective, share your thoughts on the horrifying headlines and alarming video footage from Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza we have all been seeing since Saturday? Well, with yes, but with some caveats. One of the things that is so important in this moment is, is not to take everything that we are seeing without recognizing that there are bad actors trying to change the reality by salting social media with false things. So the, the things that are happening in Israel are truly horrific. They are, there's just no way around that. But the videos showing that there are weapons being shipped from Ukraine to Hamas are fakes. So one of the things that it strikes me important in this moment is to take a bit of a deep breath and, and not react instantly to everything we're seeing because we're only now sifting out the things that are real. So my, my, my first reaction was we can be pro-human rights and anti-death, all of us, which is a stand that I'm very eager to take. And that this is not just about Israel. This is a much larger question about the rule of law. I thought it was really interesting that Anne Applebaum, who's a fabulous observer of, of wars in general, but said, you know, this is the second time within the last two years that um, a major state actor has engaged in warfare that is, does not follow the rules of war, that is basically terrorism. And it's not, it's not a non-state actor, it's a state actor. That's a really big deal because the idea of having an international, um, re international relationships that are based in the rule of law is of course what we came out of World War II with. That's not to say that, they were never that those rules were never broken because humans got a human, but it did say that there were certain things you were supposed to do if you were going to engage in warfare, and those appear to be flying out the window. So that's another thing I think really important to keep on the table and to think about is that this is, this is not just a limited war. It's not just a, a, a war that, of course, places like the United States are trying desperately to make sure don't, doesn't spread, but that it's also a major global question of, are we going to have international rules, or are we going to basically have a free-for-all in which large countries can gobble up small countries and in which state actors can engage in the sorts of behavior that we thought we got rid of with things like the Geneva Convention, which, by the way, came out of the U.S. Civil War. Sorry, I had to say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's also, of course, a steady stream of breaking news on the domestic front. Last week's vote to remove Kevin McCarthy as House Speaker was certainly unprecedented. An audience member, Janet Finneran, asked how you think the battle for the House Speakership will play out. And further, how does domestic discord in the Republican caucus diminish the global negotiating power of the United States? A lot. So, so let me start with something that drives me bonkers, but I feel like I have to say it. For some reason, and nobody's ever been able to tell me what it was, but I sort of feel like maybe if I keep saying this, somebody will know. It's the Republican conference and the Democratic caucus. And do you know why? I don't. Um, but, but so th just to throw that out there, it's the Republican conference, which is, why, um, which is why you see it that way. It doesn't mean anything different than the Democratic caucus, but there you go. And pedant is spelled with a D. Um, uh, so the, um, 
the speakers, the, the crisis in the speaker's race, in the, in the speaker, not the speaker's race, this is unprecedented for a party to toss out its own speaker during a session, which freezes the, the House of Representatives, which essentially freezes Congress, which essentially freezes the government. Oh, that's a problem. And um, in this moment, you know, I'm a prophet of the past, not of the future, but there's a lot of ways this could play out. So you see on social media a number of people saying to Republicans, uh, especially the 18 Republicans who were elected in districts that Joe Biden won in 2020, sort of saying, you know, you don't want to vote for Steve Scalise, who claimed that he was uh, the KKK leader, David Duke, without the baggage. And you sure don't want to vote for uh, Ohio Representative Jim Jordan, who was instrumental in the January 6th attempt to overturn the lawful election of, of uh, President Biden in uh, 2020, because that's essentially a vote for Trump. And that means you're going in front of the voters in 2024 with either uh, a, a, a leader who is associated with the KKK or a leader who is associated with trying to overturn a lawful election, that's not going to play well. We know that's not going to play well. So there's a lot of pressure on those 18, as well as others, to cast their votes for a Democrat or to vote present so that the Democrats can, elote, can elect as Speaker Hakeem Jeffries of New York. That seems logical, first of all. And, but, but a lot of people nowadays say to me, well, that's never done. That's never done. That's actually not true. When you have these, these moments in which it's very hard to elect a speaker, it is not unheard of for there to be coalitions. So our longest fo fight for speaker was in 1856, and there were, I believe it was 133 ballots before Nathaniel Banks became the Speaker of the House. This is the beginning of the session. But the point there is that uh, he was, uh, was actually a member of a new party. He was not a Democrat or a Whig, and they balloted and balloted and balloted and balloted, and basically at the end of it, they're like, we want anybody who can fog a mirror. He qualifies. He's going to become <laughs> speaker. So it is done, but in the 20th century, it is crazy rare, crazy rare, and, and almost certainly unlikely to happen, almost certainly not going to happen. So that means the next, po the next question is, you know that, that Scalise and Jordan do not have the votes because the Republicans don't want them to be the, their, the heads of the, of the party. So that leaves the potential for a more moderate Republican to become Speaker of the House. But in order for that to happen, a number of Democrats have to vote present. In order for that to happen, they have to be promised, and, and, and Hakeem Jeffries put this out in, a, in an op-ed in uh, a major paper, I don't know if it was the Washington Post or the New York Times a few days ago, in which he said, listen, if you just promise to bring things to the floor for an up or a down vote, that's enough. We will go ahead and we will vote president, and you can have anybody you want, but we need to have that on the table. So far they're saying no. So that brings up the next question. Maybe the idea is just to freeze the Congress. And this is the, the th sort of thing that keeps me up at night because, of course, we have more than 300 military positions that are unfilled because of Tommy Tuberville's senator from Alabama hold on military promotions. Uh, he says it's because he disagrees with the Pentagon's abortion policy. Let's see how that one plays out. Because that's what he says. Uh, that, that doesn't mean that's why he's doing it. That's what he, why he says he's doing it. And of course, we also have crucially important diplomatic positions that are unfilled as well, including Israel and Egypt, which one would think would be somewhat important nowadays. And um, the, you know, I would love to say, well, this is just one of those things that happens, and the speakership's going to happen, this is going to happen, because this has happened in the past. We're, we're in uncharted waters. We don't know what's going to happen. And the future will help us explain this moment because we will know whether the, the Republicans simply say, well, we're not gonna fill the position, so good luck legislating. Or if they say, crap, we can't have this happen, so we'll go ahead and we'll fill it with you know, someone and, and that we really do wanna govern. And I don't think we know the answer to that. Well, speaking of uncharted waters, 91 indictments and a host of other legal troubles. What are you talking about? <laughs> Actually, I'm joking, but, but I looked at my phone before we came in here, and George Santos just hit, was hit with a with a, a superseding indictment. And but that's only that's, that's only fear. like 26. Yeah. So he's got to so, up his game a little. Former President Trump's um, 2024 presidential campaign seems pretty cooking with gas. 
Nancy Hall, the retired CEO of Georgia Public Broadcasting, ask your predictions for how these legal cases will impact the 2024 election cycle, and is there any historical guidance for what we're about to see? Isn't it fun to be in a time when we have no freaking clue what's gonna happen next? <laughs> So there's nothing, we, we have no precedent for a presidential candidate who is running for office. Uh, we do have a, a precedent for a presidential candidate who's running from office from jail. That was Gene Debs in 1912. Eugene Debs, he got about 9% um, um, of the vote. Um, not bad, running from, as a socialist from office, but I mean from jail. Um, so remember, I know what happened in the past, not what happened in the future, but I do have some observations because I do read the news constantly. And one of the things that I think we are not paying enough attention to is the fact that most people have not seen President, former President Trump since 2016. That is, he was under very tight wraps when he was in the presidency, and then he was down at Mar-a-Lago, and he appears in front of cameras in ways that are very tightly cut, for the most part. If you are watching him, he looks terrible. He cannot put a sentence together. And he's obviously under extraordinary stress. So that's before we even get to the indictments. I don't think he's going to play well on the, on the uh, campaign trail, even to the degree. I think, I think that's why he's not doing the debates, is because I don't think he, he can stand, he can hold himself together that long, and his handlers know it. So that's the first thing. I do think that the indictments, they matter for many reasons, which are very interesting for democracy. But I think for a presidential candidate, and it does look like he's going to get the nomination, it would be, I'm not saying he will, because a lot can happen between now and then. But I think that it will highlight for the American people just what went on, and it does not look good. And the reason I say that is because if you look at the numbers of people who were concerned about what happened on January 6th, they skyrocketed during the, the uh, congressional hearings. Lots of people weren't paying attention until they saw it on the nightly news. And the more we see this on the nightly news, I think the more people are going to say either, I don't like that guy, or I just want to get away from the chaos. And that's actually, I think, going to be a big deal going into this election, is people just want a break. Don't you love every minute when you don't hear from President Biden? It's like, <laughs> look, I don't have to think about it. Well, we had only one question submitted by a college student, so just to make you miss being in front of them. Um, no, you don't have to do tomorrow's assignment. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia Ski is um, currently enrolled in a class taught by former Georgia Governor Nathan Deal. His course is called The Keeping of Our Republic, and he outlines um, tumultuous periods which our country has survived. Now, I think he probably needs your book as a future text for this class. But um, Olivia asked which historical events you see as most similar to what we face today with the unwavering MAGA support of Donald Trump and what guidance for countering and overcoming this support might history suggest? So I feel like you all know the answer to that. What era do we always look back to in this moment? 1850s. And actually, I have one of my former students here tonight. And she's sitting there going, 1850s, 1850s, 1850s. Um, so this looks very much to me like the 1850s. And, and while that always forces people back in their seats and, and, and they say, are we headed for another civil war? That's a different question. But the reason the 1850s always fascinated me is because in 1853, it really looked like elite enslavers were going to take over the country and from there take over the world. So they had taken over the presidency, they had taken over the Supreme Court, they had taken over the Senate, and they had it made strong inroads on the House of Representatives. And in 1854, they managed to force through the House of Representatives a piece of legislation that would, in fact, allow enslavement to move into the American West, where they would create new slave states that would work with the states in the American South to make slavery national. By 1854, it looks very much like the elite enslavers have won. They're going to take their system of uh, of their labor system, they call it, based in race, uh, their economic system, not only across the United States, but also across the world. And they're quite articulate about this. They, they literally say, um, 
Thomas Jefferson was wrong. You know, this was that idea that people are created equal was completely ridiculous, and we're going to wipe that out, that silly idea out, and we've got the way of the future. And we're going to be the ones who are going to bring our brilliant new system around the world. By 1850, by after this law passes in the spring of 1854, people in the North begin to organize, and they look at each other and they say, you know, I don't agree with you about immigration. I don't agree with you about finances. I don't agree with you about internal improvements. But by God, I agree that this country was supposed to be a democracy in which people were treated equally before the law and had a right to a say in their government. And if we turn everything over to those guys, that's all gone. By 1856, they had formed a new political party, that's the Republicans. By 1859, they had Abraham Lincoln articulating a new vision of government that wasn't simply about enslavement, it was about the idea that government should not just serve the very wealthy, protecting their property. It should, in fact, help ordinary Americans have access to resources, for example, and to equality before the law. By 1860, he's been elected to the White House. By 1861, he has signed the Emancipation Proclamation, ending human enslavement in the United States. By 1863, before the end of that year, he has given the Gettysburg Address, rededicating the nation to a new birth of freedom and making the Declaration of Independence the centerpiece of America. In less than 10 years, we went from the rich enslavers get it all to this is the, or, the country for ordinary Americans. And they did it because people woke up and said, listen, we may not agree about anything else, but we can agree this is supposed to be a democracy. And that's what I think we're seeing now here in America. Your mother's family has lived in Maine since that's the kind 1600s. Of a jump. <laughs> well, it is, but, but it's, it, there's a point to this question. Okay. And your father has deep southern roots. So I'm wondering if your dual north-south heritage factors into your fascination with this particular period of leading up to and right after the Civil War. And especially, did any of that factor into how the South won the Civil War, the book you published in 2020? No, weirdly it didn't in that um, the, the, my interest in history really came from my mother, from the northern side, and, but she wasn't particularly interested in the Civil War either. I think the th place where it matters that my mother was from Maine and my father was from Mississippi is that I feel like I have had a pretty rounded uh, a sense of appreciation for different regions in this country. And a lot, not a lot of people remember that, that dad was from the South all along. Uh, his family was from Virginia, and then he was raised in, in Mississippi and Arkansas. Um, but, you know, you grew up in a household where one speaks with a heavy Maine accent and the other speaks with a heavy Southern accent, and we all have that bland, we don't have an accent, my siblings and me. Um, I think you, it gives you a very different perspective on the country as a whole. But her daddy did a poor job of raising her right because she'd never had pimento cheese, y'all. I had to ask what it was. <laughs> um, so um, as you were writing Democracy Awakening, you were also producing your daily column, an incredibly high daily word count. So how did you go about deciding which content was book worthy as opposed to being published in the daily column? And then Pam Flash asks how you plan your writing and organize the threads connecting historical precedents, and do you have research assistants? What a great question. No, I don't have research assistants. People send me tips, um, which is very helpful. What I do have is really good training on doing research. And people always say to me, how do you know all that stuff? I'm like, I don't know that stuff. I know how to look it up. Um, and, and you don't realize, just like all of you are specialists in whatever you're specialists in, you just know where that is. And I could know more. You know, I'd be like, how did you know what drug to use? You know, that's because you know it and, and I know where to look for stuff. But the question of what goes into the, the, the letters versus the book is an excellent one because the letters really are different. Every piece of media I do is, I have very different goals for it. So the letters are really a record, if you will, of this moment. And what I'm trying to do is write for a graduate student in 150 years what is important about today. 
and so I'm trying not, I'm always trying not to, re, to, to, to report rumors, for example, because then I've screwed her up, right? She's going to have to figure out where I, where I went wrong. And that's kind of why I have a lot of the footnotes. Although that's also for people today to say, you know, I'm not sure I like, I, I agree with that inter interpretation Richardson is using. Let me see what her sources are. That's exactly what we should be doing. And people call me out on stuff um, and say, I, I disagree with that. And I'll say, there's the article right there. Um, and you can disagree and say, well, here's another article. And I'll say, oh, crap, that's right. That's probably better. But, um, but that doesn't happen much, to be honest. Um, so that's really its own body of work. It's a record. And I, I sometimes I feel like I'm a spider sitting in the corner of the, of the window weaving, right, watching and weaving. The book was designed to be an answer to the questions that people ask me every day. How do the parties switch sides? Um, what's the Southern strategy? Um, what does it mean to be a conservative? You know, those large questions that people literally ask me every day. But what I found was quickly that the overarching question that people ask is, how did we get here? Where are we? And how do we get out? So that was the organizing principle. And I wrote 30, they're very short chapters. It's 30 chapters, 250 pages. And I wrote them and I set them aside and I, I did a bunch of other things, in, things including getting married, um, which took a little bit of energy. And then when I, yeah, he's great. And then, then I went, when I went back to it and read it through, it was an entirely different book than I thought it was. And I ended up rereading about 80% of it. And one of the reasons that I have been so happy to have friends at these events and family and the people who've been turning out is because it really does feel like it is your book as much as it is my book. Because what I found was the book had kind of written itself when I wasn't looking. It was a story about how people give up on democracy, how they can be convinced to back a strong man, how a strong man then welds them into a movement. And that's interesting by itself, but the cool part was how we get out. And that ended up, when I looked at it and, and recognized what I'd written, I threw out about 80% of the book and rewrote it uh, entirely. And it, it kind of feels like I had only a little bit to do with it, like I was wielding the pen. So, um, so it ended up being a very different book than I had intended. Now, the question about how do, how do I write? Was that the last part of that? Well, I think you've kind of answered it all. Um, but there was a lighter note question that somebody submitted. Libby Gazansky wanted to congratulate you on your recent um, September first year wedding anniversary. September and 10th. She asked, now that you're married to a lobster man, how frequently do you eat lobster and what oh. is your favorite lobster so, dish? So you know what, you are gonna hate me for this. I can't even believe this is being live streamed. I can't believe I'm saying, neither of us like lobster. <laughs> So, so we do eat it to be sociable with family maybe once a year, um, but we would each rather have a hot dog. So the only way to eat it is boiled, although you'll be proud of me for this. I, I did manage, so at the end of the year, and you're also going to hate me for this, at the end of the year, Buddy's a dealer, so that means he buys from a lot of people and then he sells it on the, on the market as well. Lobsters. Lobsters, yeah. Yeah, I know. He always, he's always saying, I'm talking to my dealers. Um, but so at the end of the year, he usually has like, a, like a, a significant part of his tank is full. So on December 24th, when he closes for the year, he brings it all home and we have to eat the lobsters. So I know, I know, it's actually somewhat of a hardship for us, but I invented last year lobster and grits. And okay. you know, I get credit for that, don't I? And that's, that's okay. So there you go. Oh, that's wonderful. Works. Now, in your columns, lots of bacon, lots of garlic, and you're good. Oh yeah, that would be good. Yeah. That's your southern coming out. That's right. <laughs> in your columns and books, you often use the term movement conservative, and Jim Guest Jr. of Roswell asked who coined the term, and and would you explain why movement conservative is such an important term in the way you write? Right. Okay. So movement conservatism is actually not named until I think it's the 1970s. It may be the early 1980s. It's actually Sidney Blumenthal who was writing at the time for, I don't know, I'm going to go with Washington Post, but I could be wrong about that, um, who coined the term, but it was eagerly embraced by the people who were, uh, it, whom it was describing. So movement conservatism came out of the opposition to the New Deal. And it's actually articulated in 1937 very thoroughly but in a, in a uh, movement called the, a, 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 a group of 
de Southern racist Democrats and anti-government regulation Republicans who come together in 1937 to push back against FDR uh, by publishing or by, by trying to come together and writing what they called a conservative manifesto. The thing gets leaked to the press, everybody runs away from it like little rabbits, but they, uh, the principles in it, the idea that the government that FDR had instituted that um, regulated business, provided a basic social safety net, promoted infrastructure, and slightly protected civil rights, that's really gonna take off under Truman and then later on under Eisenhower, that that government was, uh, was an, an offense to what they considered conservatism, which was the 1920s. So they write this manifesto and it says we gotta get rid of business regulation because it interferes with what businessmen are able to do with their property. We need to get rid of the basic social safety net because that belongs to churches and it's none of our business. We need to get rid of infrastructure investment because that too should go to private investment and there's, there's money to be made and private individuals should be doing that. And civil rights are nobody's business. We protect states' rights in this country. Well, the reason I just listed all those things is that should sound really familiar if you are listening to the news today. That I, those ideas behind this conservative manifesto then get lifted, and of course I'm putting together a whole bunch of history here, but get lifted into the Conscience of a Conservative, which is written by, by William F. Buckley Jr.'s brother, L. Brent Bazell, in 1960, and is published over Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater's name as part of his way to try and bring together those people who hate the New Deal. And that set of ideas becomes this, the, the, the motivating factor of the Goldwater Republicans or this faction that's trying to get rid of the liberal consensus that was so extraordinary, extraordinarily popular among both Democrats and Republicans after World War II. And they deliberately called themselves conservatives even though as they were articulating this vision, observers recognized that they were actually advocating what was quite radical uh, overturning of a, a, a very popular laws and a very popular governmental system. So they grabbed that word, that name conservative, to make themselves sound as if they were embracing the principles of somebody like Lincoln or earlier somebody like Edmund Burke. And those are slightly, more than slightly, those are quite different things. But the reality was they were radicals. And that idea of them being a movement is a political term. So they were a group of political animals, if you will, who were embracing this concept of conservatism as it was articulated in 37 in order to change politics. And that's very different than the idea of conservative ideology as it came out of uh, the, the reaction to the French Revolution. There's gonna be a quiz later. <laughs> With Roe overturned, many states um, no longer allow women autonomy for personal medical decisions. Jean Dufort from Madison, the town Sherman refused to burn, <laughs> asks, where is the path for encouraging those who have traditionally voted Republican to become single issue voters on the question of protecting and restoring reproductive freedom? So it is worth pointing out that since the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health decision of June of 2022, I even talk like I'm writing a letter, don't I? That's, that's sorry about that, I didn't used to do that. Um, it is worth noting that uh, Repu uh, Democrats have been overperforming in elections by about eight points ever since then. So I think we're already, I think people are already aware but, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting moment. My thing is always the way you change politics is you take up oxygen. You talk about these things. You make people recognize what's really at stake here. And you can see the effect of this in things like the pushback against um, school vouchers across the country where people are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not parental choice. This is parents losing choice and being very clear about what that language actually means. So I'm always talking about taking up oxygen. But... The, um, the larger picture here I think is really interesting because this is the first time in our history that the Supreme Court, it's been done by other elements of society, but the first time the Supreme Court has ceased to recognize a constitutional right. That's a really big deal. And if they can cease to recognize things that previous courts have recognized as constitutional rights, that is, they didn't convey those rights. That's a big distinction here. They didn't give people those rights. They recognized that those are constitutional rights. 
So what other constitutional rights are gonna be on the table now? And we already know that there are a lot of them that are on the table. And that, I think, at the end of the day, is the same sort of thing that, that inspired the people in the 1850s and that Lincoln talked about, is that if we are not all equal, it is only a question of time until somebody comes for you. And that was a message that really resonated for, for the people listening to Lincoln in the 1850s, and they were all white propertied men who recognized that those principles really matter. And that, you know, I, I think we'll be hearing a lot more about going forward. Now, you took a leave of absence from Boston College to finish Democracy Awakening. And instead of being in the classroom, you now have daily interactions with more than two million effusively grateful Substack subscribers, <laughs> more than 1.7 million followers on Facebook, and then in recent weeks, sold out audiences like this one from Sea to Shining Sea. So how does this national audience differ from your traditional college classroom? And how are you finding yourself communicating different types of information in a different way? And then, is there anything you miss about college students? Okay, so um, yes, on, I think on all that. So first of all, um, the, I, I still teach. It's just that the class has got a lot bigger and I don't grade papers. I always laugh. I always laugh when people say to me, "I really wish I could take a class with you." I'm like, "You are like, you know. <laughs> if you want a quiz, I can give you one." Um, so I, 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 I love history. I love this country. I love the human concept of self-determination, and I feel like that is the ultimate goal of humanity. And the fact that people want to talk about it and want to hear about it is the greatest gift that anybody could ever give me. So. I love what I do. I, I absolutely love it. I do, and there is a difference though between what I do now and what I do in a college classroom, and that is, and I'm very aware that there's one of my best students sitting in front of me and she's listening, and she's a teacher now herself, so I hope I don't screw this up. The point of a college classroom is different than what I do. The point of a college classroom is to get people to think critically and to learn who they are and to learn how society changes. At least that's what historians do. That's what we teach, how societies change. Is it great men? Is it movements? Is it economics? Is it religion? What do you think changes society? So what I'm really doing in a classroom is providing information and facilitating people's ability to have uh, respectful discussions about those things. For what I do now, though, people are much more interested in being told what's going on. Like, I don't have to sell this material to people who want to read it. And I've never advertised and I never will. This is all word of mouth. And, you know, I, I think that's a little different than in a classroom where I trust adults to be able to weigh the material, although I give them the, the tools to do that, and to have respectful discussions. And what I'm really trying to do is cut through the crap that's out there in a way that I, I don't think my students come to class with really strong ideas about W.B. Du Bois. So I think I'm pretty much on different, on different turf there. I will say that it's worth remembering that my life really has not changed that much in that I write. That's what I do. I write on my laptop in the same chair all the time I always have. It's just that a lot more people read me than used to. And so it's this weird thing that like people's like, oh my God, you know, all this stuff going on. And I'm like, not really, not for me. <laughs> um, so my life, so, that, so that's different. And the, the thing that is different for me is the questions that people ask. I mean, I've learned so much because people will come to me and say, well, what about this? And what about this? And I'll run off and think, oh wait, that's really important. So, um, so I feel like we have this ongoing conversation that one does have in a classroom, but in a classroom, it, you don't ever know what it's gonna change into. And I do think that that's been really important about this moment is that a good teacher trusts their students to, to, to carry some of the weight. Like if you just try and yell at your students, they tune you out. But if you give them the power to do the learning and to teach you, you create something incredible that, that is different for every classroom. And I think one of the advantages I've had in this moment is I, I'm letting everybody else carry half the weight. And that, I think, means we've created something really vibrant and much more creative than I ever could have done alone. And that's why I think it feels so great to so many people. Well, the distillation of a question submitted by many is, there are two sides to every coin. 
as you think about the future of American democracy, please share what worries you the most and also what gives you the greatest reasons for hope. That's a great question, and I will tell you, if we had free and fair elections in this country, I would have absolutely no concerns at all. I would be, well, I wouldn't be in my kayak right now because it's dark, but, but I would just be sitting on the coast of Maine, eating M&Ms, going out in my kayak, and writing a book. There's this really cool shipwreck in 1889, and not caring if anybody read it, right? But the problem is that since 1986, the Republican Party has very deliberately worked to suppress the vote, to gerrymander the states, to, uh, to cut back the Voting Rights Act of 1965, uh, to, to manipulate the vote in this country, to pack people, to pack the courts. And that's what scares me, certainly since the Trump administration, when during his term he very carefully put his own people in Republican Party leadership positions in Republican-dominated states. They are not representative of the Republican Party even in those states. They are representative of the, of the MAGA Republicans. That worries me to the point it keeps me up at night. But what gives me hope is that people always say to me, like, how can you sleep at night? And, and I'm not kidding when I say I was much more worried in 2014 than I am today. Because we people like me talked about the many ways in which we were losing, losing our democracy. And people were like, yeah, OK, what's for dinner? And now, look at you all. I mean, now people, now I've got people coming up to me and going, can you please explain the, the Electoral College? Do you have any idea how many times I was asked that before 2019? And I bet the answer was zero, right? And the fact that so many people are waking up to what democracy means and what it requires of us, we got to show up, we got to put skin in the game, and we have to reinforce the idea that we should all be equal before the law. We have a right to that, and we have a right to, the, to a say in our government, means that we have created and are in the process of creating the kind of movement that I talked about in the 1850s. And that's what gives me hope. That being said, I would also like to emphasize that when we get periods like this, when there has been extraordinary um, uh, overtaking of the system by one party or another, and I could talk about the times it's happened and all that, when people start to wake up, it's not just politically. It's in a, time of, a time of extraordinary creativity and new inventions and new music and new art and new combinations and new communities. And part of what what I would love to pe for people to feel is the joy in the creation of whatever it is that's going to come next. And that seems to me to be not only a way to get away from, oh, at least I have some hope, to, no, 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 after 40 years of fighting a holding action, we get to build something. And who knows what it's going to be? We've got a whole new generation who's going to have a say in it. And I find that not only a reason for hope, but also a reason for extraordinary joy. We, you mentioned the Electoral College, and in your books you write about the historic times when the Electoral College selected a president who had not won the national popular vote. And for this audience, Hillary Clinton comes to mind rather quickly. Um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has announced he will be an independent candidate for president, which raises even more questions. So several people have asked about the Electoral College, including Stacey Harmon Holloway of Avondale Estates and Miram Sharp of Savannah, who Miram has friends over to watch the live stream down in Savannah. Miram suggests the Electoral College has a detrimental effect because it flies in the face of the long expressed one man, one vote idea. So should the Electoral College be abolished? What is the solution to someone who can win the popular vote but lose the presidency? That's not sustainable. The idea that we can have a president who is elected by a minority of the popular vote, you know, if it happens once in, in a century, we can live with it, but it's happening more and more frequently, and that is just simply not sustainable. You can't have a government in which people buy into a system that doesn't represent them. And, and I am incredibly tempted to talk about the theory of democracy, but I won't because I know that not everybody's patience for that sort of thing is as high as mine is. That being said, the Electoral College is in a special thorn in our sides because it was originally designed to be representational. And in 1800, 
my dear friend Thomas Jefferson, and I'm joking, any of you, uh, that's for people who listen to the Now and Then podcast that Joanne Freeman and I used to do, because I would send up Thomas Jefferson every week, and every week she would fall for it. Um, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson recognized that he would have won in 16, I'm sorry, 1796 if, in fact, Virginia, which had a gazillion um, electoral votes, because they're the ones who wrote the Constitution until there was the first census, um, they would have won if he could have gotten all the Virginian uh, electoral votes. So he convinced people in 1800 to use the electoral votes of Virginia as a block rather than representationally, and of course he won. That meant that after 1800, almost every other state decided they also had to have a winner-take-all system. There are two states now who don't do that, Maine and Nebraska, but each of us only have three electoral votes, I believe. Maine does anyway. So. The, the, every time anybody says, let's get rid of the Electoral College, which is deeply problematic, not only for that reason, but for another reason that I'll tell you about in a second, people say, oh, we can't, we can't, we can't, it's been there forever. James Madison took a look at what Jefferson had done and said, we cannot do this, it's gonna destroy our system. We must have a constitutional amendment to make sure that people use the Electoral College representationally, which is what we always intended. So every time I hear we can't get rid of it, I'm like, okay, let's go back to the original one, let's make it representational. That would be a start, but the other piece of this, of course, is that in 1929, Congress capped the number of people in the House of Representatives, recognizing that under the census of 1920, there were more people who lived in the, um, in the cities than there were living in the country at that point. So they capped the number of people in the House to make sure that it would not give the cities an advantage. What that means is that if we had the old system of representation that was in place before 1929, we would have more than 1,000 people in the House of Representatives. That, of course, would dramatically change the power of the big, uh, the big states like Texas and California, New York and Florida. So the, the, one of the things that, that a number of scholars keep talking about and it's getting very little attention is, and it, it needs attention, is the idea that we must figure out a way to make the House of Representatives actually reflect population again, which it doesn't. And that has all kinds of problems, not only the Electoral College, but the fact that, you know, if you were in a district where there were only 30,000 people in your district, you'd probably know the people who represented you. Certainly I do, and not because we hang out together, but because there just aren't that many of us, right? Um, like literally, they, they, one drove by me the other day, I was like, hi, I'm like, I'm on my way to a wedding, how are you? Um, but when you're in, in now in the average size of a district is over 750,000 people, you don't know those people. And you start to feel like your democracy is not actually part of your life, it's somebody else doing something far away. And that's something that I think we're gonna have to answer in the short term, not in the long term. Our next to the last question. Um, is an important one, I think, in front of an audience of energized battleground state political activists like the ones in this room and um, those online. Several submitted similar questions. Lee Sewell asked, can we save our country and our democracy? Vivian Hoard asked, how do we fix this mess? So with those inquiries in mind and many others similar to them, what call to action do you issue for how concerned citizens best focus their energy between now and November 2024? So first of all, can we right this ship? Yes. Um, I believe that with all my heart, but I have to believe it with all my heart because what is the alternative? You know, and this is one of the things that, that, I, that I always like to call people's attention to there are many people who say it's done, it's over, American democracy is over. And my answer to that is always that, do you think it's gonna be better what comes next if we don't defend democracy? Because it's pretty clear what we're looking at is autocracy. And I promise you, there is not an authoritarian government in the world that treats its uh, at least political minorities, religious minorities, ethnic minorities, racial minorities, sexual minorities, better than a democracy does. So I believe it, and I have to believe it with an almost religious faith. So how do we do that? Well, the, there are many ways. You know all the obvious ones. You know, um, run for office, register to vote, give money to causes, et cetera. But, but what I'd like to emphasize is what I just said, the idea that the way you change democracy is by taking up oxygen. And so many people say to me, it's just, I'm just one person. You know, what can I do? And the answer is find a friend. 
and then find another friend and talk about what you care about. Go to local um, school board meetings. Go to local council meetings. Speak up. Uh, you know, one of the things that jumps out to me is we now know that a lot of the people who have been launching the book bans, um, they're like, there's one state, there's only two of them. Two. Not not 2,000, not 20,000, not 200, that, two. Like, the, in this room, if we all showed up, th they're, they're completely outnumbered. So, take up oxygen, make sure people get to vote, advocate for, for, uh, for voting rights, advocate for causes you believe in, and now after giving you all those admonitions, let me tell you that it works and that we now have proof. I mean, I could give you lots and lots of proof uh, from history, but Clarence Thomas recused himself from a January 6th case. Now, there's caveats to that. It was pretty clear it wasn't going to go through and all that. But do you really think he would have done it if there weren't such an outcry about him? Similarly, look at the way that Republican candidates are now talking about anti-abortion laws. Remember, right after Dobbs, the Dobbs decision came down, they were having these signing statements, they were having these signing parties and handing out pens, and you know everybody was wildly excited. And then they started doing them later and later in the afternoon until they started doing them in the evening and not holding press conferences about them. And now they're workshopping language that is anti-abortion language that actually doesn't mention anti or abortion. And, and it's pretty clear that's because they're looking at the sheer numbers of people who are turning out to vote against them and giving the, the Democrats an eight point lead in all these special elections. So in, in, I would say between now and November of 2024, it is all hands on deck, talking not only about the things we care about, but also really insisting on reality, on a reality-based community, and saying, you know, that's not true, that didn't happen, and there's some people in your state who are kind of not good about that. Um, <laughs> although, I have to say, my, my real nemesis is actually not in Georgia, it's in ten she's in Tennessee, but, um, but ins insisting on calling that out, calling the lies out, but also I would say embracing this idea of what democracy really can be. Because the more we just fight about what other people are lying about, the more it sounds like we're accepting their terms. The idea of a democracy that embraces all the creativity I was just talking about, all the people and the future and, and addressing climate change and rebuilding the economy, which is, is working under Bidenomics, telling a new story for this country, a, a new narrative, a new way of looking at the world and saying, you know, this is a party, and I don't mean a political party, but a, a party of democracy that you might want to be part of. And that changing of our language and of our understanding of what it means to be an American, that democracy is always under construction, it was never perfect in the past, and it's never gonna be perfect in the future, because like I say, humans got a human. But that's part of our right as Americans, it's part of our duty, perhaps, as Americans, but it's also part of who we are as humans. And that idea of contributing to the project of human self-determination, it seems to me to be one that's worth rallying around and inviting other people to rally around as well. So when you interview people, you often ask what they would add to the conversation. So turnabout is fair play. What should this audience know which I failed to ask you about? Isn't that funny? Because that's always my, my ace in the hole, right? Like, because then people say, well, I don't have much to say. And then they say something profound and brilliant. And that's whenever I interview, that's all in there recorded. Almost always we ended up flipping the script and that's what people would talk about. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I think you did a great job. Didn't you do a great job? And I don't, I don't really have, I don't think I really have anything. Well, we sure have enjoyed hearing what you have to say, and we want to get you back so that you can actually visit the Carter Library, go to the Civil Rights Museum, and have some pimento cheese. Well, I would love to do that. But, but this is the part that is not about a question that I always like to say. I want to thank you all for being here, of course. 
but for being part of this phenomenal journey and for teaching me as much as you have. And, you know, I was not lying when I said I think I am the luckiest woman on earth to be able to have met so many wonderful people around the country and to be able to go home every night and keep the record for this country. That is a historian's, if, the, if historians could dream that big, that would have been my dream. And I never forget that I'm here and I get to do that because of you all. And I really thank you both for that and for having so much to do with this book, which is basically all of ours, not just mine. So thank you all so much from the bottom of my heart for, for, for being part of all this and letting me be part of it too. So I think you all are glad you came. <laughs> if you enjoyed tonight, I encourage you to look at the Carter Library's website and also the uh, uh, Acapella Books website uh, for upcoming authors. I do ask you one favor. We have to share Heather with the rest of the country and she's got a plane to catch. So if you'll keep your seats for just a minute and we're gonna get her to the airport. Thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs>